So you want to be a Martian, or I'm assuming that you have some desire to be a Martian because that's why you clicked on this thumbnail and paid attention to it in the first place. And when we're talking about being a Martian, we're not talking about running around in giant tripod machines, killing thousands of people until you succumb to diseases that your bosses back on Mars were too stupid to inoculate you against in the first place. And when we're talking about being a Martian, we're not talking about being a Matt Damon clone stranded on Mars for a couple of years, living off of potatoes that you grew in your own shit. No, when we're talking about being a Martian, we're talking about being a Martian colonist. Somebody who decides not to visit Mars on a temporary basis, but instead you have made the decision to commit the rest of your life to colonizing another world. And given the fact that going to Mars and living there in one third gravity for years is going to have an impact on your body that's going to make it very, very difficult for you to ever return to Earth, you are very likely making this commitment for the rest of your life. Now, first of all, if you're my age right now, you're very unlikely to ever be a Martian unless we've had some sort of massive medical breakthrough in the next 10 or 20 years and have seriously extended human lifespans because no matter how aggressive Elon Musk gets, it's very unlikely that we're going to see ordinary people, in other words, people who are not award-winning scientists, engineers, etc., going to Mars and then next 20 years or so. So instead, we're going to skip a little bit more than 45 years into the future. 2069. And yes, I've picked that date because it is a full century after mankind first set foot on the surface of another world. A hundred years seems to be quite a long time to have to wait, but... That's the cards we drew and the decisions we've made. And if we are at a point by 2069 to where normal people, everyday people like you and me, might be able to make the conscious decision to go to Mars, to make our fortune, make a career for ourselves, or just to have an adventure of a lifetime, well, that will be a truly amazing thing, given the fact that substantially more than 40 years have passed since that historical historic day in 1969. But let's be optimistic. Even though Starship hasn't made it to orbit yet, at least not at the time of this recording, let's assume that everything goes very smoothly with the development of Starship and with other interplanetary endeavors and normal everyday people can get to Mars. What's next? Well, that's what we're going to be spending the next couple of episodes at least discussing. We're going to discuss how we get to Mars, how we survive on Mars, the type of work that we might be doing there, the types of challenges that we're going to be facing very different to the types of challenges that we face here on Earth, and why the hell would we want to make such a decision in the first place? So first of all, you obviously need to get to Mars, and believe it or not, in 2069, Mars by Starship is still a well-established method of getting to the Red Planet. That is to say, if you're not a particularly wealthy person, Starship is a completely reusable system by now. It's a much more mature and well-established system that doesn't require a whole lot of complex low-Earth orbit refueling because there's an extensive network of low Earth orbit refueling depots already established with all kinds of propellant for just about any type of rocket you can imagine. One of the most amazing 
exciting experiences of your trip thus far? Was your rendezvous with a colossal depot in low Earth orbit something that you were actually able to see on a relatively clear night in your overpopulated city? Something that you looked forward to seeing up close and personal, even though it was such a utilitarian thing, still so massive and such a huge leap from what mankind was able to do just a few short decades ago. But after that, things got very long and very arduous because 2069 is not an ideal time to go to Mars. It is not one of those years where Mars is in opposition, where the travel time between the planets is relatively simple. Instead, you have to embark on an alternative trajectory that takes you past the planet Venus. Now, your travel advisor told you that this was actually a pretty practical way to fly simply because you can carry out an aborted Venus if it becomes absolutely necessary and return straight back to Earth, which you cannot ordinarily do on a traditional Earth to Mars trajectory. Plus, you get to see Venus up close and personal as you take advantage of a gravitational flyby that increases your delta V or your velocity. But you still have a hell of a long ways to go. This journey is going to take a little bit more than six months, a bit longer than the traditional flight from Earth to Mars. And since you're not rich enough to travel on a nuclear ship, you're having to use good old fashioned chemical rockets that take six months, not 90 days, or like some of those new ion drives, as little as 45 days to get to Mars. Nope, you're stuck with a six month travel time, all in microgravity, all packed in with lots of other passengers, but the money you save on this particular journey is going to be well worth it given the amount of extra money that you were able to invest in this cooperative venture that is hopefully going to make you a very rich Martian. But right now, you're a lot more concerned about the imminent landing because the way Starship lands hasn't changed a great deal in the last several decades. If you want to take advantage of an orbital approach and then get ferried down by shuttles, well, that's something that costs extra. The best way, the least expensive way to get to Mars is on the direct suicide route, as they call it these days. That is to say, directly enter the atmosphere, use the atmosphere to reduce your velocity as much as possible, and then do the pull up and pray maneuver, as they call it, engaging Starship's old, reliable Raptor 20 12 engines in a crazy high G maneuver and hopefully to set down safely on landing pads that are well isolated from the rest of the colony. As your ship begins to touch the upper atmosphere, you forget about all of the money that you're saving. You forget about all the radiation you may have sucked up during a longer travel time of six months instead of three. You forget about the fact that this old ship is not equipped with an artificial magnetosphere the way a lot of those newer ships are. You forget about just about everything except whether or not your ship is going to make a safe landing. Sure, 99 9.5% of landings take place without a hitch these days, but that doesn't mean you're going to land safely. And yet, before you know it, after you're pulling your heart out of your throat, that is, you've sat down safely on the Martian surface. And this is only the beginning. As the door opens, you are greeted by a sight unlike anything you have ever seen before. You are located in a place called the Noctis Landing Site at the western end of the Valles Marineris and the eastern end of the so-called Noctis Labyrinthus. The cliffs in the distance are almost eight kilometers tall, five times the height of the tallest cliffs in the Grand Canyon. You haven't seen anything like this before in your life. This is the kind of sight that prospective Martians dream of seeing. The nearby Martian city of Labyrinth is not one of the largest cities on the planet, but it's very well located for your purposes because there's a hell of a lot of water at the western end of the Valles Marineris, all trapped in a massive glacier.
Glacier, and inexpensive water rights are extremely important to you because like Mark Watney, the guy who inspired you, the fictional guy that is, when you were a little kid, you're a botanist and a farmer. And the types of food you intend to grow are specialty items, things that the increasingly wealthy people on Mars, especially the asteroid miners, want to take advantage of. Because living on Mars is a very difficult thing. If you're an asteroid miner, it's even more difficult because you're spending a lot of your time in deep space. You don't envy those people's lives for sure, because even though they're making a killing off of the rare metals and other materials that they're finding deep in the asteroid belt, materials that are a lot easier to access because of Mars' low gravity and ease of access to the asteroid belt, well, they're getting very wealthy, but at the same time suffering from extreme privation. That's something you and your partners are planning to do something about while making a healthy profit at the same time. You don't intend to grow the staple of life that Martians are generally used to, that is to say grains and potatoes and vegetables, maybe a couple of raspberries every now and then, you intend to grow fruit trees, and also you intend to raise fish by means of an old but well-established method of crop production, aquaponics. And this is an ideal place to do it because the Valles Marineris is located close to the equator. It's a relatively warm place and it gets a hell of a lot of sunlight as long as you're a good distance away from the cliffs. So as you make your way along the Martian surface in your rover, trying to ignore the effects of one-third gravity on your tired frame after you've spent six months in microgravity, you begin to see how other Martians are living their lives. Everything is very utilitarian as far as most of these habitats are concerned. Mind you, most Martians aren't lucky enough to live on the surface at all. Hiding away from the radiation, most Martians live either in lava tubes or artificially dug caves beneath the surface. Lots of them never see the outside at all, although you don't understand why that would possibly be the case. You are so accustomed to outdoors living that the notion of locking yourself away somewhere deep beneath the surface of the planet sounds like like your own private version of hell, and that's something you're not going to put up with. But many Martians do, and even those on the surface of the planet usually establish themselves in temporary locations, looking for new resources, new sources of water, new types of metals, and sometimes their ships serve as a temporary refuge while they scratch for that one crack in the ground where they'll never have to scratch again. But that's not going to be you. Fortunately, you've signed on with a cooperative organization with an owner that has a little bit of money to invest in a decent habitat. He believes that he's going to get better work out of his people if he establishes a pleasant working environment. Like many surface habitats, your home is going to be built by robot and built out of local materials, what's called ISRU or in situ resource utilization. The shape is kind of unique as well, a unique shape that works in conjunction with the differences in pressure that exist on Mars, and those differences are colossal by the way, which allows for fewer building materials to be required in order to build a larger habitat. A very unique design, but you're not an architect, you're not an engineer, you're a botanist. You're just grateful for a place that's going to have a little bit of natural light coming in. Natural light can combined with lots of protection from Mars surface radiation because the materials that are being used, the regolith concrete as it's called, will provide a tremendous amount of protection from the radiation and even the windows, the way they're set up with overhanging ledges will provide protection from the sun as well unless the sun is close to the horizon when the shutters are supposed to be pulled. Of course, you don't know a whole lot about 
how the interior workings are designed, aside from the fact that just about everything is going to be recycled, the habitat will have its own internal power source, and your favorite part, the hanging gardens that aren't going to provide enough produce to completely suit all of your own needs, but still, you'll be able to grow a lot inside this habitat in addition to the farming habitats that are going to be set up nearby. You're going to be sharing this habitat, of course, with about a dozen other workers. There isn't a whole lot of allowances for privacy on Mars, where living space and life support comes at a premium, especially if you're on the surface. There are environmental suits and a hard docking facility that allows direct access to a rover and shirt sleeves rather than having to use an environmental suit, but you're looking forward to the spaciousness of the place. At least that's the way it's been described to you, and although the bedrooms are not particularly large and there isn't a great deal of allowances made for personal possessions or anything, you're going to be doing the kind of work that you love in a planetary environment that's completely different than anything you have ever experienced. And also, given the fact that there are environmental suits and EVA training included with your package, that means that you'll have an opportunity to venture out onto the surface from time to time and look at landscapes in the Valles Marineris different than anything else that any human on Earth has ever seen, or at least most humans. Is that the klaxon reminding you to like and subscribe? No, it's the klaxon reminding you that there's a dust storm incoming, and it's going to hit your rover before you can get to the safety of your habitat. You've heard about these things. You were hoping against hope that you wouldn't encounter one, at least not before you arrived at your destination. But now, one of these electrostatically charged nightmares is bearing straight down on you, and you have no choice but to wait it out. Cursing Martian weathermen under your breath, and maybe not so much under your breath, you, your fellow technicians, and the rover crewmen prepare to button up and get ready for the fight of your lives. Smash that like, hit that subscribe, please don't forget to tune in to chapter 2 of this series if you really want to be a Martian, and as always, stay angry about space! <laughs>